Between the 9th and the 15th centuries, contacts had been established between West Africa and Western Europe as a result of the success of the Portuguese in pioneering the sea routes around the western bulge of the Sahara. With news of commercial opportunities, other Europeans, including the English, French and the Dutch, began to do regular business in West African waters. The development of plantation economies in the tropical lands of the Americans led to a steadily increased demand for African labor. Therefore, many Africans were shipped across the Atlantic, which is known as the transatlantic slave trade. By the end of the 18th century, the effort to abolish export of slaves was in progress. During this period also, various European powers were undergoing industrial revolutions in their home countries. The need for expansion and acquisition of raw materials for industrial production became paramount. The abundance of these raw materials in Africa increased the yearn for the Europeans to colonize the continent and rob its people of their resources to fuel their industrial revolutions. Prior to this period, the several European powers had already concluded arrangements for colonization of their specific areas of influence in the 80 odd years since the abolition of the slave trade by way of treaties, threat of war or war. Accordingly, the Berlin Conference in 1884 to 1885 was merely an international recognition of these various colonizing European powers to move ahead. The gunfire for the start of a race with two of the participants, France and Britain, had already been in training was a spark that was needed to set ablaze this key situation. France was quick to resort to armed columns in her areas of influence, St. Louis, Dakar, Niger, Dahomey, and Cameroon. Britain, on the other hand, was still reluctant to take up arms. When she eventually did, between 1896 and 1900, it was a question of time, as Ashanti, Yoruba land, Benin, Northern Nigeria, including the Sokoto Caliphate, fell prey to the attacks of the British. The old northern Nigeria, as well as certain areas in present-day Niger Republic, was the scene of a violent and decisive revolution at the beginning of the 19th century. The movement known as the Sokoto Fulani and the Usman Donfodio Jihad marked a crucial turning point unprecedented in the history of the area. Over the ruins of numerous societies, in these vast areas of about 250,000 square miles, is established the new political organization known as the Sokoto Caliphate, based primarily on Islamic norms and rules. Hausa land was the main theater of the Sokoto Revolution or Jihad, which had effects on the peoples of the Western and Central Sudan, from the Senegal to the West to Lake Chad in the East, and from the Sahel in the North to the borders of the tropical rainforest in the South. All these areas of polities where the jihad existed and spread constituted the area known as the Sokoto Caliphate. In order to understand the contacts between the British colonialists and the West African Emirates, we asked why and how the caliphates met the British challenge the way they did, and the vehement resistance and antagonism of the masses to British occupation. The last decade of the 19th century may be described as a decade of trouble for the Sokoto Caliphates and other Emirates in the Western Sudan. This decade witnessed a decisive change in British policy towards the Caliphates. Before this time, contacts between the Caliphates and the Europeans were few and infrequent. These contacts were established by British travelers, all of whom were practically British citizens or other nationals sponsored by the British government. Consequently, when the scramble for territories in Africa began, British influence was among the most dominant in the Caliphate. Relations between the Caliphates and Europeans during this period of sporadic contacts were mainly commercial. British commercial establishment began with the founding of the Inland Commercial Com Company in 1833 and the expedition which that company sent to the niger benui confluence in that year. Henceforth, British enterprise within the Caliphate was confined to the niger benui waterways. 
Nupe Emirates became the main base of British activities. By the 1870s, the proliferation of British companies, which engaged in cutthroat competition, had degenerated into a commercial war. This marked the beginning of a new phase in the relations between Europeans and the Caliphates. This phase equally characterized the age of the Europeans' attempt to establish political control over the Caliphate. Rather than diminish, the gulf between the two sides progressively widened in subsequent years until it ended in a military clash. It was this development that ensued between the British on one hand and the Caliphate in the period between 1897 to 1903. Nupe Emirates became the base of British activities during this period. By 1897, the activities of the British have become so pronounced that Nupe was conquered by the British. The British involvement in Nupe Emirates could be traced to the activities of the Royal Niger Company in the niger benue confluence. By 1895, the Royal Niger Company assisted the, Emirate, the Amir of Nupe to evacuate the military ports of the French in Borgu and Bida. Ironically, the company did the gesture to make way for its establishment of military posts in the area of Jeba and Bajibo. This was a clear manifestation of the violation of the existing agreement between the Amir of Nupe and the Royal Niger Company. Therefore, war became imminent. Both sides only needed time to mobilize their forces. All the Nupe African pilots and canoe men working on ships and in the Royal Niger Company were commanded by the Amir Abu Bakr to leave the company's service, making sure that the company became paralyzed. This was to serve a temporary measure of show of resentment to the British move. The Amir continued to reinforce his forces as the British moved to occupy his territory became more glaring. A force of an estimate of 10,000 men was put forward by the Amir in this direction. The hostility of Nupe Emirates to the British had been touched off by Western African Frontiers Force survey parties sent to explore the region. The parties of Wright Canal, Maryland Coal and Lieutenant Munch Mason encountered considerable opposition from many villages and towns on their way. They therefore had to use Nupe, which stationed in a marauding force on their territory against the British ready to attack the frontier force survey parties stationed at Wushishi. With the British forces advanced by O'Neill and some troops, they started guerrilla warfare against Kontagora and Bida, defeating their patrols in many skirmishes. With the return of the frontier forces troops from Ashanti, a full-scale attack by the British on Nupe Emirates, Kontagora and Beda was undertaken early in 1901. A total of 10 officers, 3 non-commissioned officers, 323 other ranks, 3 maxim guns and 2 75mm guns were at the disposal of the British. The Emirates forces, numbering about 10,000, were armed mostly with arrows and Dane guns. The Emirates army charged fearlessly. When the British replied with volley. Finally, the issue was resolved in favor of the British. These defeats of the Nupe Emirates led to the subsequent weakening of the state and precipitated the permanent establishment of British bases within Nupe, which would be used for subsequent conquest of the other Emirates. The closing years of the 19th century witnessed an increase in the power of the Baloguns in the Eloran Emirates and the degeneration of the Emirs to mere puppets. The support given by the white men to the Amir to buttress his waning power divided authority in the Emirates of Eloran by widening the gap between the Amir and his Balogun. The Baloguns, who enjoyed popular fellowship, became naturally identified with opposition to the influence of the white man. The geography of the Eloran Emirates made it vulnerable to external attacks by the Europeans and other rival powers in the region. The resistance to British occupation in the area took the form of simmering discontent and unrest, which rendered the position of the British very precarious 
down to 1903. The Amir Suleiman, appreciative of the boost of his power derived from the British backing, accepted Lugat's proclamation with gratitude. By 1900, the belligerence between the Amir and the Balogons became widespread. The Balogons began to gather more strength in their bid to resist the British. Balogun Ajikobi and Balogun Alanamu unsuccessfully attempted to throw the residents and 10 civil police officers out of the town in September 1900. Because of the strong resistance of Ilorin, Umar, the deposed and exiled Amir of Bauchi, was brought to Ilorin. By January 1903, a letter came from the Sarkim Musulmi or the Sultan, urging Ilorin to create disturbance to divert attention from Sokoto. During this time, the frontier forces from Lagos had already arrived because of the unrest. The Amir, who was pro-British, then refused the order. Fear of the British reprisal facilitated occupation of Ilorin. The subtle but passive resistance in Ilorin was typical of the attitude of other Emirates over and above whatever military resistance they could muster. To the British, Ilorin resistance was more virulent than military confrontation which they could deal with. Although this resistance continued, the British established a foothold in Il Ilorin where the Amir was basically a puppet of the British. Aside other Emirates, Adamawa was already feeling the pounds of European conquest. The Germans determined to occupy most of the Emirates, which was assigned to the Germans in the Berlin Conference between 1898 and 1899 sent forces against Tibati. The reigning Lamido, Amalamu, was taken prisoner and a relation of his was installed. In the event, Zuberu, the Amir of Yola, had an encounter with the British attempting to protect Yola from threats. The British went ahead and established commercial interests in the area. Zuberu resisted this move by the British. In Yola, those who stood for resistance ultimately prevailed over those who upheld surrender. Zuberu, of course, belonged to the resistant group. Yola's hostility towards the British continued until the Amir forced the Royal Niger Company at Yola to pull down its flag and quit the station. Zuberu's stance was that the British presence in the region should be curtailed. The Amir, realizing this new development, threatened to drive the British army to the river. Yola's force attacked the British group but could not beat the British. The British counter-attacked the Yola forces using shells and subsequently defeated the Yola forces. Yola was then overrun which brought the power of the Adamawa authority under the British. After the occupation of Zaria, the British invaded and occupied Kano. Unlike Zaria, where there was little or no resistance, Kano gave a strong resistance. Her preparations for war were, were getting across to Frederick Lord Lugard. The city started rebuilding her walls. The erections of her strong gates were completed. Towns in the Emirates, acting on instruction from Kano, similarly rebuilt their walls and redug the trenches around them. Kano procured large quantities of arms from Tripoli merchants and ran away frontier forces of the British. The Arabs in Kano were equally ready to help the Amir in putting up resistance in the event of an attack. The British colonizer, Lugard, decided to attack Kano, realizing that it has become an enemy. Lugard wrote, The lives of the men who are to the best of their ability doing the Amir's work here and honestly working for the good of these people will not be safe. Lugard and the Amir became staunch enemies, each anxious to protect his interests. In fact, the war Welcome given by Magajin Kefi at Kano was an excuse for war by the British. As the British war fever increased, the Amir of Kano became relentless in his hostility. By 1902, he had made a proclamation forbidding caravans of traders from leaving Kano to the southern Emirates as usual. He saw this move 
as a possible avenue for Northern Emirates military confederation, which might turn out to be disastrous to the British officers. Armed with a lot of weapons, Lugard decided to advance against Kano in the early years of 1903 with 24 officers. 12 NCOs, 2 medical officers, 722 rank and file made up of 550 foot, 71 artillery men, and 101 mounted infantry with 475 millimeter guns and 4 maxim guns. As part of Kano's war plan, the chief of Gaia, a town on the Zaria Kano road, and all the headmen of the towns had been instructed to resist European advance at Bebeji. These villages, which had been fortified with a view to holding up the British advance, were deserted at the approach of the British force led by Colonel Morland. The mounted infantry in February 1903 exchanged shots with a Colonel scouting patrol at a distance of 800 yards from, a f from the formidable walls. The walls had been marvelously constructed about 30 to 50 feet high with a ditch running around them the gates were a set of massive entrance towards about 50 feet long and so tortuous that they could not be easily reached by shell fire all these were aimed at resisting the british conquest of the sokoto caliphate the walls were reported to be strongly held by colonel soldiers as the british approached with a series of gunfire the gates and the wall could not be properly breached by gunfire as the entrance and the wall proved impervious to the gunfire of the British troops. The British forces later turned to the gates of the west, that is Kabuga Gate, where after a series of attacks, a breach was made at the gate. This broke the strong resistance hitherto posed by Kano and its army. The British conquest of Kano became glaring as the Kano soldiers withdrew from the walls and fled. With estimated fighting force of Kano at 800 cavalry and 5,000 foot infantry, a lot of casualties were recorded. This marked the defeat of the Emirate of Kano by the British. At this juncture, it can be seen that the efforts to resist the conquest of the, the all-powerful Sokoto Caliphate by the other Amirs had failed. Even Kano had fallen to the British cavalry and army. The next resistance to British was the Sokoto Caliphate itself. The conquest of the Southern Emirates had further reduced the Caliphate's potential for resistance. The real resistance and the defeat of the Caliphate will only be well understood after the fall of Sokoto. Obviously, occupation of Sokoto had been the ultimate goal of the British from the onset. The Royal Niger Company had attempted to install a residence in Sokoto. Equally, throughout the first half of the 19th century, the reports getting to the colonizer Lugard from interior about Kano and Sokoto served as pointers in his mind that a British advance on the Southern Emirates was imperative and to be undertaken with the least possible delay. Sokoto authority witnessed with apprehension the rivalry between the French and the Royal Niger Company in Borgo, Yauri and Nupeland in 1894 to 1895 when the company mounted its aggressive offensive first against Beda and Ilorin in 1897 the Khalifa or Caliph will only send letters to the Reverend Emirs asking them to expel the company from their territories. Underlying the passive nature of the Caliph's hostility towards the Royal Niger Company in 1897, there was equally the French threat by the establishment of military posts close to Guandu, as Karim, Illo, and Guamba. Finally, Goldie played up the fact that even through the Royal Niger Company invaded and defeated Bida and Illo it neither replaced the local ruling dynasties nor stationed troops in the capitals of those emirates. By 1898, the Royal Niger Company had set a force towards Sokoto under the guise of helping the Serkim Muslimi or the Sultan against the French. But the real aim of the company was to, to establish an advanced military post near Sokoto and to get the Caliph to accept a British residence in his capital. When tensions mounted, the Sultan sent the Amir of 
Kuntagora at the head of a force of 7,000 horsemen to tell the British forces to go back or be attacked. By August 1898, the company had established another military post at Illo, but the caliph objected to it. The Sir King Yauri equally supported him. When the Royal Energy Company found the situation in Yelwa, untenable, the British post was abandoned in September 1898. Shortly after, the people of Illo in the popular uprising annihilated the whole of the Inlo garrison. The Sultan Abdurrahman never relaxed his hostility and resistance towards the British. By 1900, he had formally suspended relations between himself and the Royal Niger Company. With the suspension, Lugard sent his proclamation to the Sultan. He rejected the British pretensions to sovereignty over the Caliphate and warned the British messenger to bring no more messages from them. By February 27, 1903, the British forces had converged in Kaura Namoda. During this time, Sultan Atahiro was on throne. He tabled the matter of the impending British attack. There was a question of migration or peril. The Sultan and some of his men agreed from both from the abode of the infidels. No sooner had they started preparation than the British forces came knocking. The Sultan, caught unaware, had to lead his people to put up resistance in the face of the combatant British troops. The British army of a strength of 25 officers, 5 NCOs, 2 medical officers and 1 medical NCO, 68 Ghanets, 656 rank and file, 400 carriers, 4 Maxims and 475mm guns marked towards Sokoto and routes Argungu, Shagari and Sokoto. Skirmishes took place between the patrols, scouts of Sokoto and the British forces. Sokoto warriors were armed with spears, arrows and Dane guns. The Khalifa commanded the front with Ibrahim, Serkin Rabah and Muhammad Miturare on the left and right flanks respectively. As the war progressed, the superior weapons of the British outweighed those of the Caliphate's forces, hence the defeat of the caliphate. Amirs like Bauchi, Gombe and Zaria were equally conquered but the process of these conquests were incomparable to the Emirates like Kano and Sokoto in terms of resistance. The three Emirates of Bauchi, Gombe and Zaria showed little or no resistance to British conquest. This does not suggest however that they did not exist per se but that the type of resistance put up was passive or inferior as compared to Sokoto and Kano. This may be born out of the fact that previously conquered Emirates irrespective of their hostile resistance towards British conquest still fell prey to the foreign power. Therefore, the resistance towards the British was futile. And by the end of 1903, the British had control over almost all of the Sokoto Caliphate. The ease with which the Sokoto Caliphate fell to the British conquest is understandable, judging from the hurried preparations of these emirates to meet the British enemy. The superior weapons of the British plus the experience of the British forces in their conquests and land grabs in Africa that they had acquired before that war rendered the efforts of the Sokoto Caliphate forces futile.